Hey, what's up everybody? This is Caroline. Welcome back to part eight of Beginning Metal. In the previous video, we created an illusion of depth and perspective using matrices. We used a two-dimensional model rotating in three-dimensional space. In this tutorial, we're going to create a three-dimensional cube and see how to render one model in front of another in metal. At the end of this video, we'll have a scene with a rotating cube with the zombie picture further back in the scene behind the cube. Whereas the quad had four vertices, a cube has eight vertices and six sides, also called faces. We'll create a vertices array with these eight vertices. There will be 12 triangles involved because each side has two triangles. And here's the indices array for each triangle. Unless we tell the GPU otherwise, it will render all 12 triangles. Obviously, this isn't very efficient because at this angle, we can only see six of them. We don't want to render all the faces that are facing away from us, just the ones that are facing towards us. And we can do this with something called backface culling. We can tell the render command encoder to cull backfaces, but we also need to tell the command encoder which way our triangles are facing. Have a look at this triangle and the indices array. The vertices are in counterclockwise order. The triangle is made up of vertex 0, 1, and 2 in that order and the triangle is facing towards us. When I turn this triangle away from us, the indices 0, 1, and 2 are now in clockwise order. So any triangle with its vertices in clockwise order is facing away from us. Here we tell the command encoder that the triangle vertices are in counterclockwise order. The technical term for this order is the winding order of the triangle. We then set the cull mode to be back. This means that any triangles that are rendered clockwise are going to be culled. The standard winding order for 3D OBJ format models is counterclockwise, but the default in metal is clockwise. So when we set back face culling on, we almost always have to explicitly specify the winding order as counterclockwise. Otherwise, we'll get strange artifacts. So with backface culling on, we only render those triangles that are facing towards us. However, rendering only front-facing triangles still doesn't take into account depth. We have to tell the GPU how to measure depth. And we do this using a depth stencil state. The word stencil in graphics language means which fragments are drawn or not drawn. You can create stencil buffers to mask out areas of your rendered image. The depth stencil masks out fragments that are behind other fragments. This blue square is behind the yellow square. During rendering, the rasterizer creates fragments for the blue square and for the yellow square. Each fragment can be depth tested with another fragment in the same position. The blue fragment furthest away can then be discarded and not processed by the fragment function. We create the depth stencil state using a descriptor. When the depth compare function is set less, any fragments further away are discarded. We record the depth value for testing against other fragments with is depth right enabled. Before doing the draw call, we set the command encoder's depth stencil state, which is passed along the pipeline. So let's create a cube and see if we can create depth. In most 3D applications, cubes and planes are considered primitive objects that can be created with just a click of a button. So I'm going to refactor the code in the demo in our plane object to be a primitive and subclass that primitive with a plane and a cube. That way, I can just define the different vertices, but use the same rendering code for both. This is where we left off from the challenge. We have the zombie rotating in three dimensions. So now that we have that third dimension, 
we're going to start using three-dimensional models, such as a cube, rather than a flat plane. Apart from the vertices array, the cube will render in exactly the same way as the plane. So I'm going to rename the plane class to primitive, and then I can subclass primitive with both a plane class and a cube class, and the subclasses will just hold the vertices. So I'll create a primitive.swift file and copy the plane code into it. I'll change all the occurrences of plane to primitive. And that's created a duplicate class. The vertices are currently a stored property, but we can't override that. So I'll add a build vertices method for the plane and the cube to override. And I'll call this from the three initializers before setting up the vertex and index buffers. And I'll remove the data from the vertices and indices arrays. In plane, I'll change it to be a subclass of primitive and delete almost all the code. I'll override build vertices with the planes vertices. So the plane class consists only of the vertices and indices data. Build and run to make sure nothing's changed. So now I'll create a cube primitive. I've already created a cube.swift file with the vertices and indices, so I'll just drag this in from the resources for this video. And you can see it just contains the vertex and index information. Now I can change game scene to add the cube as well as the plane. Because of all the refactoring we've done, you'll see how it's really easy to add new models with different vertices to the scene. And I'll change the cube to rotate instead of the quad. And I'll position the quad back behind the cube and down a little bit and get rid of the second quad. And build and run. And you can see there's something very wrong here. The cube is weirdly transparent in places and even though I sent the zombie to the back by setting its Z position to minus three, it's still appearing in front of the cube. Currently we're showing the back faces of the cube and there's also no depth to the scene. So just as I showed you in the slide, I'm going to set the winding order and cull those back faces. I'll do this in primitive before the draw call. Now when I build and run, the cube's back faces are culled, which is the result we wanted. One thing to be aware of is if I rotated the zombie picture, it would only show for half the time. When the plane is reversed, it's showing a back face, and so it would be culled. But here we still have the problem that the zombie picture should be behind the cube and not in front of it. This is to do with depth and the order that the triangles are rendered on the GPU. We haven't told the GPU about depth yet. And we added the quad to the scene after the cube. The quad will be rendered second, even though it should appear behind the cube. To tell the GPU about depth, we'll create a depth stencil state and store it into the command encoder. We'll use the same depth testing method on all models, so we can do all this in renderer. So in renderer, I'll add a new property for the depth stencil state and create a method to build this depth stencil state. As usual, we'll create the state using a descriptor. We need to set two properties on the descriptor. Depth compare function is the comparison method. Here we use less to check whether any fragment is closer. Any fragments that are further away are discarded. We also want to record the depth value so that we can compare against it later. So we set is depth right enabled to true. And now we create the depth stencil state using the descriptor. And I'll call this method from init. In draw in, I'll set the command encoder's depth stencil state. And build and run. And now the zombie is behind the cube. I'll make the zombie picture bigger in the game scene so we can confirm that.
and the zombies fully behind the cube now. That's it for this video tutorial. In the challenge, you're going to create a camera which you can move around the scene. As usual, full details are in the accompanying challenge document. In the next video, we'll take a look at how to import 3D models without having to specify all the vertices and indices. I hope you enjoyed this video tutorial. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again next time.